This is what they get for doing AZA. I will continuously pronounce it wrong in protest. Hey there, this is your friendly neighborhood host here to give you a content warning. There will be discussions of suicidal thoughts in this episode. So if that's going to cause any problems for you, consider not listening to this episode. Hey, thanks for joining the Escape With Me book club. Escape with me, Lizzie Sawyer. And me, Sam Reiner. Into our most recent read. Come with us as we evade reality and go into detail about a new book. We're going to be covering it from beginning to end, cover to cover. So remember, there will be spoilers. Today we're going to the kingdom of Aortha. Originally published in 2006, Ferris is a retelling of the fairy tale classic Snow White. While she is given a hard time for her appearance, Aza's singing ability is unsurpassed. In a kingdom that treasures singing voices, that is a very big advantage. When Aza learns the ability to throw her voice, she soon finds that her abilities are being taken advantage of by the new queen. As misfortune after misfortune befalls Aza and the entire kingdom, Aza must do her part to protect herself and eventually even save Queen Ivy from herself. The only way to do that that, however, is to truly accept herself. Which is difficult. That's hard for anyone. Yeah, and I think it's a good topic, before we go too into it, I think it's a good topic for a mid book, because this is being read by 12-year-olds who are just starting puberty, and puberty sucks and makes you hate yourself. And no one looks nice going through puberty. No one. But this was a me pick. I read this one. I read a bunch of Gail Carson Levine books. So things like Ella Enchanted. And I also read one by her. I think it's called Ever. Ever's kind of cool. It's about a wind god. I don't remember. It's been a really long time. And so going into this, I remember reading it and I I still own a copy. And so when we were picking out books, I was like, this is a good book. I remember liking this. And then I went online and looked at all the reviews and they were all like... 3.2, whereas Ella Enchanted has high fours. And I'm like, oh, maybe this wasn't as good as I remembered. And then I read the book as an adult. And here we are. (laughs) Here we are. I'm not going to say it's problematic. It can be borderline. I definitely had a few issues with this book. I would not give it to my child to read. No. But I do think it brings up some very good topics that need to be talked about for girls that age and boys that age, but especially girls that age. So it is a midlit. The major themes are things like accepting yourself and learning how to stand up for yourself. Things that will hit with preteens and early teenagers. To judge a book by its cover, I... I can't remember. That was so long ago. What cover did you have? There's been a couple of new ones. The one that I have, I think is the original. It's a girl and she has black hair and green eyes like the main character. And then she has a silver mirror and it's obstructing the rest of her face. Which honestly is actually a pretty good cover. There you go. That's the main concept. There is a mirror that makes people really pretty. And then that is our main character. There you go. Mine is not. Not that. Mine's actually not a good cover from that standpoint. It's a sheet of music. That's the background. And then there's a picture of a girl who's got brown hair and dark eyes wearing a purple dress. Generic girl looking to the side at the word Ferris. And that's it. Oh, that's... That's really bad. Yeah, it's not great, which is why when I found it, I was like, who is this by? Are you sure? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's not a great audiobook cover. Nope. The whole thing was that her face was obstructed. It's like, oh, only her eyes are pretty. And so that was good. So you could imagine what she... Ah, that's so dumb. I hate it. Yeah, it's not great. (laughs) But my foggy, foggy memory. I figured it would be something about a mirror. I mean, I wasn't wrong. It took me a while to figure out that it was a Snow White thing because I didn't read the back of the book. And even if I did, I don't think the back of the book specifically said, hey, this is Snow White. Pale skin and ruby red lips didn't give it away? No, it did. And I was like, huh, that's suspicious. And then later on, some other stuff happened. I'm like, okay, this this is Snow White. That's not a coincidence. Because at first I was like, okay, hmm, I'm going to log that away. That's interesting. But it could have been just the character. But nope, it was very specific. Red lips, black hair pale skin. Technically, it's a ton hair. That's the color. Is that how it's pronounced? Yep. Because it looks like Hutton. Yeah, Hutton. The joys of listening to an audiobook. There's going to be so many words I'm probably going to pronounce wrong because she just throws words in and I have no idea how to pronounce it. And I've just been pronouncing it Hutton in my head for forever. So that might come out a bunch. Hello, I've made up a word. 
Good luck. It's so weird when they have fantasy pronunciations and you have to guess what it is and then you find out it's wrong. She does that a lot. It's kind of gratuitous how much fantasy words she just comes up with. It is. The names drove me nuts. That queen better be pronounced Ivy or I'm going to rage quit. (laughs) No, it's Ivy. There are so many names like Inge. I guess that's her parent. Olo. Emily. Emily. The gnome names that they all like start with Z. (laughs) Areda and Emily. I don't know what the parents' names are. Well, I want to know the choir master. U-E-L-L-U. Yulu? And is it Ijuri? Ijuri. Ijuri. And Uchu? Yeah, Uchu. Uchu. I hate this. <laughs> what is the senior guard? U J U. How the heck? <laughs> it's been a week since I've listened to it. So you're lucky I remember how to say the prince's name. I hate all of this. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. As a dyslexic, this naming structure is the worst thing in the world. And I hate it. Reasons I listen to books instead of read them. I hate it. <laughs> is dumb. <laughs> I could go through the entire audiobook and try to find all the names for you if you want, but that takes a lot of time. It's like Ella Enchanted. It's like Ella. Lucinda. Lucinda is such a narcissist. Oh my goodness. Oh, she's the worst. <sighs> she is the worst. But I know you'll thank me. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe it's because I love Ella Enchanted the movie so much. The movie's a good time. I love Lucinda. She's the worst. Worse. I love her so much. I hate Lucinda. Like I said, it's probably because Ellie Enchanted, the entire thing is her first one was retelling Cinderella. And so it's Ella just constantly trying to track down Lucinda to retract basically the curse she was given. It's like, yo, please take away this curse. It was just so funny. And all of the misadventures she gets into following Lucinda and the stuff that Lucinda knows. And then she comes back on this one and gives Ivy the mirror. And the mirror is murdering people. But listen, it's like, I love weddings. Here's a mirror. But when they die, then the guy in the mirror, he gets to have a vacation. It's a great plan. Or he'll just kill them. He'll just speed the process up instead of doing what you think and being nice and helpful. No, he's just going to be like, yeah, so you should uh, get yourself killed. Yeah. <sighs> Oh my gosh, Lucinda's an idiot. When you give a bubble brain power. The sheer stupidity of this fairy. She is my favorite. Oh, she's, I just, I don't know. That is a nice villain right there. It is very infuriating. Yeah, she's just bumbling idiot who thinks she's doing all this good stuff. And then everyone's like, no, you're not doing good things. This is the bad things happening. And she doesn't believe them. And she's just an idiot. And it's, oh, it's just so great. I love Lucinda. She's an idiot. I enjoy her. I can't take her seriously. Once again, probably because I've watched Ella Enchanted the movie way too much and that Lucinda is definitely an idiot. (laughs) But that's basically the entire plot is Lucinda gives this cursed gift to Queen Ivy and it turns her beautiful but actually the mirror is trying to get her killed so he can go on a vacation for X amount of time until Lucinda decides to come back and give the mirror to someone else? That's kind of a plot hole. You mean I'm trapped in purgatory until you decide to give the mirror to somebody else? Yeah, so (laughs) that part doesn't make a lot of sense. So she just gives him this mirror and so the mirror is trying to kill the owner so that he can have a vacation. Well, he doesn't want to be trapped in purgatory either. So yeah, that's the plot of the book. Well, that's the backbone of the book. That is the main conflict. The main issue. Yeah, but the main character character has very little to do with it until the very end. Mainly because Ivy is not the main character this time around. So Ella was the main character in her book and she was the one who was cursed by Lucinda. But this is a secondary character who has been cursed by Lucinda, but she doesn't know she's been cursed. I didn't write down his name. I didn't write in where I wrote all the characters' names. Skullney? Yeah, Skullney. The mirror. And we don't know that Ivy's cursed until a really long way into the book. And I don't know how I feel about that. Well, you say that as soon as the mirror did the haha, you're pretty thing, I was immediately like, ah, mirror's evil. The mirror's evil. She's talking to the mirror. It's a magic mirror. It's bad, 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 bad. I mean, for 
for sure. But I thought it was bad in the way it's always played up. Like, oh, it's putting her against people by telling her that other people are prettier than her or something like that. I was not expecting full on murder the first time I read that. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, the murder was kind of a surprise. I follow the Arthur Weasley train of thought. If you can't see where it keeps its brain, then don't trust it. <laughs> it was just in the third act coming out. Yeah. So this entire time I've been trying to murder her. Here are my reasons. Here are the things I have tried. And if this doesn't work, I'll just get her to kill herself. You know, I do think it's funny that as soon as it was like, you're in the mirror, I can be in the mirror with Skolny if I die. Well, let me just kill myself. Because I was like, Skolny, you could have just probably from a couple days ago been like, if you kill yourself, you can come in the mirror with me. Yeah, he had to wait. She was still feeling guilty for that. And then she found out Aza was still beautiful. It's out of nowhere in a lot of ways. The final this is what's happening. Because th throughout the whole thing, she's like, oh, I have an informant. And you're like, your informant's an idiot. At one point Aza's like, oh, could it be a spy from her own kingdom? And I was like, that would have been interesting. But no, it's a mirror trying to kill her. Your informant's the mirror. Your informant? It's the mirror. It's the mirror. <laughs> As soon as they were like, yeah, so mirror on the desk and the mirror showed her something. I was like, oh, so the mirror is evil and bad and bad and evil and bad, 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 bad. Don't trust. No, 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 no. Chris, I've read so many fantasy books. I'm on the train of thought. Yeah, mirror can show me that don't trust the mirror. It's a djinn. Don't trust the djinn. It can give me three wishes. Don't trust the th anything that can give you three wishes. That's got sketchy written all over it in so badly every single time, every single time. No, 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 no. But the way that the story starts is there's a baby and it's abandoned. It's wrapped in a fancy cloth and it's abandoned in it and she's raised it in it and her entire life she's like, I'm ugly. Which is how we start with the main character. And the entire time she was like, I'm ugly. Me, someone who doesn't like using the word ugly and doesn't really think that anybody's ugly. I personally have never met a single human being that I have found ugly necessarily. I'm like, you're not ugly though. You're just different. That's not ugly. I don't think... The author was prepared to actually talk about this. I don't even think it was, I don't know if it was a well-known thing at the time in 2006. What, body image? No, body dysmorphic disorder. Oh. And it's basically something where you obsess over the flaws of yourself, whether that be you think you're unattractive because things like she obsesses over her pale skin. She doesn't like how she blushes. There are a bunch of things like there she very specifically hyper focuses on. And it's a disorder in which you cannot look at yourself without seeing those flaws, whether or not they're valid. And so that's something that happens with things like eating disorders, where they look at themselves and they constantly say, you're fat, whether or not they actually are. Like they could be skeletal. They would look at themselves and say, I am fat. And so they would try to do things like, in that case, exercise, or in Oz's case, where she constantly talks about how she's hiding her face behind her hand. And anytime she goes into a social situation, which first of all, she tries to avoid at all cost. But anytime she goes into it, she immediately thinks, they think I'm ugly. So that is something that, like I said, I don't think this author was equipped to talk about. <laughs> Knowing what we know now, it's not handled great, mainly because I don't like the ending is, oh, a boy thinks I'm pretty, so I must be pretty. Mm -hmm. That's not how this works. Yeah, that's not great. But yeah, most of my notes are, you're not ugly. You're not ugly. Child, you ain't ugly. Yeah. And having read the back of the book, she said one of the inspirations for this book was her own dislike in becoming old, basically. And she didn't like her wrinkles. She didn't like what XYZ and her own struggle with desire for beauty. And so she was writing the book in some ways in a cathartic experience to come to an answer of what does it mean to accept yourself? And I feel like you can definitely tell that in this book because Aza has a lot of issues with self-hatred. And the end of the book doesn't actually give her any answers. <laughs> no, it just kind of is like, he thinks I'm pretty. I bet I must be pretty. So I don't feel like that's really giving, say, the 12-year-old reading this any sort of life advice <sighs> other than if a boy doesn't think you're pretty, you're not pretty. Even without any sort of disorder, it takes time and effort to see yourself in a good light, especially if you're going through puberty and you have to constantly be like, I'm pretty. I'm amazing. I'm pretty. And just, you know, hyping yourself up every chance you get so that you eventually train your brain to be like, yeah, 
I'm pretty. Yeah, the self-affirmations. It's one of the things I don't think is handled very well. Because she's trying to make this whole speech of, look what happened to Ivy when she got so obsessed with her beauty. It almost caused her death. Yeah, an evil mirror took over and tried to get her to kill herself. Yeah, if you try to be pretty, evil mirrors will have you kill people. And... Ugh, don't even get me started with the actual. We'll get to the actual ending in a minute. I hate it so much. But this is such an important topic for midlit age people because between the ages of 8 and 14, girls' self confidence in themselves drops 30%. That is so much. And it's not good. And it's something we should talk about where we should talk about how to see your flaws without seeing you as wrecked or you have acne or something that makes you untraditionally beautiful. You have something like that and not to immediately go, well, I have that one thing or I have those five things and it's like, I'm ugly. And you're right. Puberty is such an awkward time. People grow super randomly and suddenly they're lanky when they were like a foot shorter at the beginning of summer. And then it's just, it's awkward. It's not a great time. And then suddenly the kid that's been shorter than you for the entire time you've known them is much much taller than you and you're like how did how and their body was not prepared for that now they have stretch marks there's just so many things that can happen around puberty and it's such a big important conversation and this book is not ready to have that conversation it is super not it is not structured in any shape or form for any sort of opening for that conversation to be had. Because like I said, the answer in the end is Aza only decides I'm going to try to see if I'm beautiful. Like I'm going to look at myself in the mirror and start doing those self-affirmations work over time. The catalyst to that is, oh, a boy likes me. (laughs) A boy thinks I'm pretty. If the prince did not like her, no lesson she learned throughout the entire thing would be like, you should accept yourself. And it doesn't help that the prince spent half of his time thinking she is a terrible person. I, mm, so I personally would not have gotten back together with the prince. No. You know, he's like, you know, I immediately knew I was wrong and I should have believed you right after. Like, okay, cool, 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 cool. However, what you said was in utter disgust, I kissed her. Wow, that's a large, big chunk of betrayal there, sweetheart. Yeah. I don't care if you feel sorry. Your immediate response was to abandon the person that you said that you loved. That is not okay. That is a huge red flag. Yeah. We're not, no, we're done here. It's done so. Me personally, I will never <laughs> be able to trust you again. <laughs> yeah, that's something that keeps popping up. Thanks for letting them throw me in prison for something that I didn't do. That whole scene is really interesting to me. Because it shows, I feel like a lot of people have heard of the halo effect. When someone sees a good quality of you, they think other good qualities of you. So you'll see it in things like, oh, he's so funny. That makes him cute. Or, oh, she's so pretty. That makes her a good person or charismatic or whatever. And so I think you hear the halo effect a lot in things like beautiful people can get away with more things. I just, that whole scene, they were like, yeah, so obviously the quote unquote ugly girl must have done it and I'm like okay cool but Ivy has clearly done a whole bunch of things to ruin all your lives and started to drive the kingdom into the ground and has just now said that she will not let y'all sing anymore which is the big part of your lives free time government you know just general being but you know she's like but but the ugly girl made me do it and you guys are immediately like oh yeah obviously the ugly girl clearly made her do it No. (laughs) So that's the opposite of the halo effect. That is called the horn effect. And it's essentially where you see a bad characteristic in someone and automatically assume other bad things about them. So for that case, Aza was not traditionally beautiful, potentially in their eyes ugly. And so they immediately assume, oh, she's manipulative. Oh, she is a bad person. She has no morals. She has all of these other things. Where you also see it in the relationship with the prince, the halo effect. Oh, Aza's a good singer. That makes her pretty. That makes her someone she wants to be around. So you see it's it's very shallow. I think that's what I'm getting down to. All of the relationships are really shallow. I think the only relationship that I don't have a 
well, other than the huge age gap, is the king g- seemed to genuinely love Ivy. Yeah, and Ivy sure loves herself. Yeah. Her aside, <laughs> the king genuinely loved her. And I mean, she had signs of genuinely liking him as well. As self-centered as she is, she did sleep on the floor on a rag waiting for him to wake up night after night. True. But counterpoint. Some people love a other people because they actually love them and want to be with them and things like that. Some people love people in a form of loving themselves. And that's what Ivy is. That's fair. She didn't love the king because she loved the king. She loved that the king loved herself. And by loving him, she could actually love herself more. But who will love me? Exactly. That line right there. And <sighs> Frankly, another thing with the whole all of the relationships are super shallow, a lot of them start off as parasocial relationships, which are when you have a connection with someone, say, a TV star, and you become a fan of theirs, and you know all these things about them, you know their favorite color, you know their birthday, you know their dog's name, you know their dog's birthdays, but in reality, the TV star has no clue who you are. And so that's the kind of relationship a lot of these start as. Like, Aza's relationship with Ivy starts with, oh, she's the queen. Oh, she's pretty. Oh, I bet we'll be best friends. Oh, I know all of these things about her. And then when she meets Ivy, she realizes, oh, I actually don't really know her, but I still want to please her because in my mind, I've built up this relationship with her, so I want to please her. And that's kind of also that happens with Ivy and the king and with the king and the entire kingdom. Because at no point do you actually hear anything where it's like, oh, the king has done X, Y, Z and that's why he's so beloved. You just hear, oh, it's the king. We love him. Okay, cool. Why? (laughs) Exactly. And so everything feels so shallow because no one has any real relationships. That's why I like the king's feelings for Ivy, specifically just his for her, not her in any sense of way. She's still like a shallow piece of... She's just a shallow piece of something. I was desperately trying to censor myself there. (laughs) I couldn't think of a word fast enough because he actually gives genuine reasons for why he likes Ivy and actual emotional reasons as to why he likes her and things that she does that are reasons why he loves her. So he he probably is the only (laughs) wholesome, deep, emotional person. And he's in a coma for most of the book. He really is. And like I said, well, first First time I read this as a middle schooler, I would have agreed. But this dude's in his 40s. That is so- I'm ignoring that. She is 19 years old <laughs> in the beginning of the book at some point because I wrote it down. He is 41 and she is 19. <laughs> And all that says to me is he went to another kingdom, found a girl who, I mean, technically in our eyes, but also even in this fantasy world is barely an adult and was like, hey, I'm a king and I think you're pretty and I can shower you with all these gifts. She got herself the ultimate sugar daddy. Her sugar daddy is the king. As an adult reading this book, nothing about this was okay. (laughs) I don't want my 19 year or like my middle schooler reading this book and being like that 40 year old has an interest in that teenager. This is okay. Mm-hmm. No, sweetheart. No. <laughs> Why did she write this? Especially since middle schoolers are usually like under 16. And you hit that point where like, it's okay. Even though I'm underage that this 20, 30 year old wants to date me. No, it's not okay. It's not okay for a 16 year old and a 21 year old. Get away from the pedophile. Get away from the pedophile. Step away. <laughs> and You can't blame the teenager because they're starstruck because it's the king or whatever sort of celebrity equivalent there is. Like, I just... No. He's in a band. He has a car. Why in the world did this author sit there and think? (laughs) This is a great idea. I'm going to write about this. He's going to be 41 and she's going to be 19. It's going to be great. She sat down and planned that out. She was like, hmm, the king. Yeah, but she needs to be about the age of the main character so they can get along. 
Mm. <laughs> or not. I mean, even if you'd made Ivy mid 20s, that's a bit better. Your brain is at least 25 and on. You're at least mostly formed in the head. I just don't understand why he had to be so old. 41's not that old. In comparison to her, that is a 22 year age gap. I don't think you could have lowered the king's age a huge amount. I think you definitely could have raised Ivy's age without there being much of an issue. It's not a great look. No. Nope. Either way, I don't, I just, I don't understand the author's thought process behind that. And that is one of the reasons that it's problematic because it's seen as a good thing. And we barely actually get to see them together. And it's just Ivy being selfish. And so we don't really know anything about the king because he's in a coma for the entire time. There are so many things in here. I don't understand what the author was thinking. For example, one thing when I read this time and I'm like, why did you do that? When Aza goes back to the tailor and is like, in the name of the queen, if you don't do what I say, she's gonna do X, Y, Z. After... Aza was like, you know what? Queen Ivy's not a good person. I should distance myself from her. She goes in the name of the queen to bully. I mean, granted, they were being bullies first. I didn't necessarily see it as a bullying as much as a warning because Aza knew that Ivy was going to ask about the clothes and if she didn't come back with them, Ivy probably would have gone down and been like, the clothes. So it was more of a warning of a, hey, so you've done this thing. I don't appreciate this thing. If Ivy had come with me, you would already be in jail. It, It wouldn't even be a question she would ruin you. But at the end, she walks away and she's like, I've learned to step up for myself. Like, that was supposed to be a triumph. No. I mean, it was definitely brave, but I don't necessarily think it was standing up for yourself as much as being, hey, so, uh, that was mean, so fix it, or you will end up in jail because I will have no control over that. She hid behind Ivy's name and it wasn't great. Again, I don't really see it that way. And then the seamstress was friends with her after after that question mark? No, not really. The mood was still definitely very much a, yeah, you still suck. Well, I meant later on, she said something about way after this, like I, I think after, after Ivy or whatever, there was the seamstress. It's like, oh, I'm still friends with the seamstress. It was like, I don't, I don't feel like you are friends. Why? No, she did this vicious mean thing to you because she assumed that you were in the queen's pocket because the queen is blackmailing you. You never actively did anything for the queen against anybody. They just automatically hated you because you were associated with the queen. Which, once again, horn effect. Friend having a relationship with someone that you don't like means the other person is not great. Once again, shallow relationships. Does anyone have a real relationship here? No. The only one I can think of is the gnome. The gnome seemed cool. The duchess with all her cats. Those are all real relationships. The Duchess was pretty cool. Crazy Cat Lady had a real relationship with her cats that are all named essentially the same thing. I take that back. I do think Aza's relationship with the Duchess was sweet. It was okay. They bonded over cats. At least they bonded over something. It wasn't an assumption based on something else. Even the prince was like, yeah, she's kind of weird. And Aza's like, Oh, she's not bad. I mean, she really likes cats. They had something. (laughs) Yeah, cats. (laughs) Cats are great. <laughs> Something. Yeah, Aza and the gnome uncle cousin, most likely a relative. He was pretty dope. He was cool. I liked him. He's the best character, hands down. This book should have been about the gnomes, period. Just about the gnomes. No one else. Just the gnomes, because the gnomes had some interesting lore with them. I really wish... We had focused more on that because I liked the idea that, oh, to humans, maybe I'm not beautiful, but to gnomes, I am. And this whole... No, he said she was ugly. Well, I mean, less ugly than other humans. But the whole, her hair is a beautiful color to them. And just this whole beauty is a construct of society, blah, 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 blah. That would be a much more interesting point at the end to be like, hey, they see me like this. They see me like this. They see me like this. Maybe I should look at myself and decide how I see for myself instead of oh a boy likes me so I must be okay. (laughs) Oh he likes me so I must be pretty. Yay. (laughs) Though I will say a boy saying that he doesn't like how you look is definitely something that will completely destroy any self confidence you have in yourself. Only if you like him. It's true. No I know but it is a self journey. It's something you need to do for yourself. Yeah and so that's why I don't like it because it's one thing to be like oh a boy likes me. No duh that's going to give a huge self confidence. Like as an adult if it's someone you 
you liked likes you. That's a nice feeling. But it's not the solution to low self-esteem. And it's definitely not the solution to a mental health problem. Oh, absolutely not. Years of therapy. And possibly some antidepressants. It's just... (sighs) She dived into some stuff. And she had no answers or even a map of where she was headed or what she wanted from it. Because the interview was after the book and she's still talking about how much she doesn't like how she looks. And I just... (sighs) No way, really? Oh, it's almost like it's a mental issue and you have to work on it over time. And maybe don't write a book about it, question mark. Maybe if you're gonna write a book about it, actually take the topic seriously and take time to actually come up with a solution, a real... So then I went to counseling and I mean, I'm still recovering and it's better, but it's still not where I wanted to be, but it'll take time and I know that I will get there. Even if she wanted to keep the whole fantasy route, none of these people have real relationships. I just, I can't get past that. Everyone is surface level. No, everybody's fake. It's great. Except for the gnomes. Yes. The gnomes are real. The gnomes are real. And her parents are real. And I just can't get over the fact that everyone flip-flops so much because no one has a real relationship with anyone. And... It's dumb. But the thing that really gets me is the ending. Oh, where she breaks the mirror? No, the epilogue. Oh, where they get married almost immediately after being engaged at the sing out of nowhere. And you're like, well, so many things happen. Excuse me? So the king wakes up and immediately is like, oh, Ivy, it's okay. You almost destroyed my kingdom and caused civil war. Silly woman. He takes her to exile. He, I mean, he goes with her to exile, but she's exiled. She, like, sends her to exile, quote-unquote, and then rules for ten years for the prince to get old enough to rule. But there was no punishment, I guess I want to put it. But there's seriously a point where the gnomes are like, hey, we just look into the future and decide what's the best situation and not. And Aza's like, I don't like that. People that do bad things should be punished. Ivy should be punished. And she never is. And then at the end, for Aza not to even be mad, like, there's no mental thoughts that there. I'm mad about this. And I was upset that she was not punished. Or at least being like, okay, now I understand what the gnomes were saying. Sometimes the best scenario isn't just to get punished. Something should have been said. That's all I'm saying there. I love the gnome scenario. I think that's great. If you can see the future, look to see down the several roads, which is most likely to be the best outcome and do that. I like that. It doesn't come into play at all. No, and it sh- kind of should have. Like, how cool would it have been if they were been like, like, judge, how do we fix this problem? And then the little gnome looks into the future and is like, this is the best solution. I would have accepted that. But no, the king's just like, so I'm going to send my wife away. I know I can't trust her for like five seconds without her trying to call a civil war and trying to flirt with my nephew and her guard and, you know, everyone around her. But I'm going to send her away for 10 years. She's obviously still a flirt and will most likely cheat on me. She's 19. I don't expect that much from 19 year olds they're just barely adults but it's seriously like she has proved no loyalty to me i'm gonna send her away for 10 years and then i'm gonna finally join her in exile i'm gonna exile myself so i can hang out with my banging wife who will have banged several other men over the 10 years yeah there's no way that's a love marriage and you will be in your 50s at this point and she will be 29 and probably will not want to hang with you any longer because she will be almost in her prime and you will be an old man. (laughs) There's nothing about that relationship that is healthy. And for it to be portrayed as a happy ending. And I mean, if she genuinely loved the king, I'd be like, yeah, it's fine. It's, you know, okay, age is just a number. Whatever. It's great. However, she does not love him for any emotional reason other than he loves me. So you're gone for 10 years and now you're an old man. And she definitely has somebody set up by then. Let's be honest, a couple somebodies. (laughs) She's got like three lovers in the closet, man. And then it's viewed as this, oh, it was such a sacrifice for him to exile himself. (laughs) No. (laughs) But it's a ridiculous amount of time that he exiles her away for Ijori to get to the right age. It's dumb. It's stupid. And I hate it. And then, (laughs) seriously, Aza and Ijori just like, yep, we're getting married. And then he springs a wedding on her. He's like, by the way, we're getting married today. Ha ha. Yay. 
No, y'all are still both like 17. What do you mean we're getting married? Oh, we didn't want Lucinda to know about it and try to gift you something. So we're just going to have the marriage today. Um, I know you're not wearing anything special or done anything special with your hair. We couldn't be bothered to tell you. We couldn't even be bothered to fake and be like, let's make you look really nice. Or I don't know. It's just I would be so mad. <laughs> Excuse you? You couldn't have let me in on the secret? I can keep a secret. You could have told me and... And I could have been in on the secret of my own wedding. I would be mad if my husband came to my work and it was like, oh, we're going to just go for this casual dinner. Oh, okay. You show up and it's like, okay, I've dressed up kind of nice because it's a date night. And it'd be like, nope, this is our wedding. By the way, this is our wedding. <laughs> Hold up. I did my own makeup and hair for my wedding, but I still did something special. No, don't just throw that on me. I'm not getting married like this. <laughs> Excuse you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't have been privy to this. Oh. Um, Oh my goodness. But yeah, apparently they have three kids. Cool. Whatever. Fine. That'll be fun during the divorce. That'll be great. Kings and queens never divorce. Somebody dies. <laughs> That'll be great when the queen gives to live in a different castle. Oh my gosh. Oh, one really cute thing is Ocho, Uchu, yeah. Uchu, the dog, adopts a kitten and then they're best friends. That's the best ending. It makes me kind of wonder how old the dog is versus how old they were when they started having kids versus how long that dog actually lived. I have no idea. I don't want to think about it. Because dogs will only live about 15 to 20 years, give or take. That is the only happy ending. Beside that, it's just amazing how much she ruined her book in the last two chapters. Can we talk about the thing that I hate about this book? All of the mythology? Centaurs are people. Yeah, it was very weird. They are not horses. If you wanted horses, have horses. Centaurs are half human, half horse. They are not trick ponies for you to just give to people or to sell or to make do tricks for your entertainment. And I know that's been a theme even in El Enchanted where the elves were slaves to entertain the humans. But nowhere in here was it mentioned that the centaurs were slaves at any point. They were just like, oh yeah, the centaur. Yeah, this beast of burden that I just kind of give you. Even in their most animalistic portrayals, they're still intelligent. They can talk! You can have whole conversations with because they're people! Drove me crazy. Even when they're kidnapping your women, they can talk. They say, yeah, I'm kidnapping your women. What are you gonna do about it? I'm a horse. <laughs> Catch me if you can, sucker. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that wasn't great. It's like, do you even really know what centaurs are? On a side note, this popped in my head earlier during that scene. How did the centaur trainer not die? <laughs> Let's talk about it. I seriously thought this was an orchestrated attempt to murder either Queen Ivy or the king. But he just walks away scot-free with the centaurs. Well, yeah, the centaur threw it. It was an accident. When clearly the centaur was like, I'm being treated as a slave and a beast of bird and I'll just kill the king. Centaur revolution. I just, I don't understand. How did even Ivy, when she was at her most crazy, wasn't like, let's kill the centaur person. They took away my husband. Centaur guy just walked off. He just left the kingdom. Here's a thought. How do you keep a centaur as a slave, as a human, it's a horse. It's a large horse that could trample you and maim you and kill you very easily. How? I don't know. Maybe they have an understanding. It doesn't seem like any sort of understanding that would be understood other than we are your slaves. Yeah, it really was weird. There's no commentary on it at all. They really did make it sound like, ooh, they're like trained seals. It was weird. I don't know what you think that these are, <laughs> but they're people. I could see it being like, oh, this is our act, like all of us together but yeah the way she portrays them is more like trained seals than a troop throughout the book it'd be periodically be mentioned but even with the gnomes at the end with the guard he's like yeah i was told i would be given a centaur before my whatever birthday which by the way that was dumb <laughs> that was dumb but you don't give people people why do the gnomes have centaurs they're underground i don't even know where they would keep them my throat hurts now from yelling about centaurs. And it was such a cop-out to be like, 
like, I was supposed to be giving that by my 30th birthday. Oh, we uh, have different time. So he totally got a centaur in time. We should have spent more time with the gnomes. The book would have been better if we'd spent more time with the gnomes. The gnomes were cool. I really wanted to spend more time with the gnomes. The book would have been better. If, I mean, she is technically gnomic, but the book would have been better if she started as a gnome. Yes. Like a human that got adopted by gnomes. Yes. That'd be cool. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to make this book better really quickly. Most of it involves putting actual thought and care into these characters' relationships. I don't know how it went so wrong. Isn't everybody just superficial and fake? all the time? Isn't that just life? I don't understand how it went from Ella Enchanted to this. Ella Enchanted was so good (laughs) and it made into a very, very good movie that doesn't really follow the book very closely at all. But it's still very good. I don't understand how an author's skill can degrade this much that quickly. Although it's not that quickly. I think Ella Enchanted came out in 1999. No, 1997. So this is almost nine years later. What happened? It's kind of like she had an idea a very vague, like, uh, I want to make a book based off of another fairy tale story. And then my beauty insecurities. Yeah. And half ass threw it together. And then was like, well, I'm here. Yeah, it doesn't feel like as much attention or love was put into it. Mainly because I think she tied it to a subject that was way too personal for her. And it wasn't a great time for anyone. It wasn't incompetence or anything like that. It's not like she can't write. And so I I feel like a 3.2 is about right. Most of the story is at least interesting. Like if I just take away all of the problematic stuff and look at it as a retelling of Snow White. I mean, it's decent. It's not my favorite, but it's at least attempts were made. I can see the parallels and some of the things like the gnomes are really interesting. I like the gnomes. I didn't understand the ogres as much. The ogres just seem kind of thrown in there like, a yeah, there's ogres. No one likes the ogres. No one trusts the ogres. The ogres have this manipulating power where they can make people think that everything's okay. Which is weird. Why would ogres need to hunt people down if they could just convince them that everything's okay? That's interesting considering that the ogres and Ella Enchanted and this is the same world did not have that power. Yeah. It only felt like it happened so they could accuse Aza of being an ogre because ogres are ugly to humans. Ah, uh, she must be manipulative and evil because she's ugly. Ah, uh, the horn effect. Except that she's not ugly and y'all are all just superficial fake people and uh, horrible. The worst. Ah uh-huh, ha uh-huh. ha. This problematic book aside and the heavy subject matter it was ill-equipped to cover. I can't blame myself as a middle schooler for liking this because obviously these are a lot of things that I've learned as an adult having already gone through this journey but I don't think I would give it to my kid because there are way too many things in there that I don't want them to think is okay but I have so many questions for the author. My big one I guess if I was actually going to have a real question and not all of my why questions. (laughs) Why? 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 (laughs) Why? Which came first? The concept of rewriting Snow White or her anxiety about beauty. Like, because she was anxious about herself aging, did that lead to her wanting to rewrite Snow White? Or was she just going down the line, like, I've done Cinderella, I've done this one, I've done this one, I should do Snow White, and then her own personal stuff came into effect. I don't know. There's a little interview with her in the back of the book, and it doesn't tell very much. I think there's like five questions. It's not a very long interview, but I don't know which one came first. Beauty is a very deep topic, even though we don't think it's that deep. It's a lot. It's a lot. When it comes to talking about it. And doing it wrong is not a great look. But it's very hard to do it right. So maybe don't write a mid-lit book where middle schoolers are impressionable and looking to you for advice even though they don't know they're looking to you for advice because they're still figuring out what is right and wrong in the world building their own moral compass based on family members friends and media around them and whatnot she tried but it's not great i want to know if she actually knows what centaurs are because i don't think she does i want to know what she thinks that that is i want to know can you show I want to know why you think centaurs are horses. Because it is apparently not what it actually is. <laughs> They're only part horses. You're not clever. If she wanted to do that, I feel like there were other mythical creatures she could have grabbed. There are plenty of other mythical creatures that would have been perfectly fine that are not 
sentient is the word that I want. It's not a creature that can speak and communicate and has its own... You, I, mm. Mm. It'd be akin to just having a mermaid show and acting like they just are seals. It doesn't make sense. Why would you do this? Why? What a downgrade. Rating awkward growing phase out of 10. It's not great. It's not a fun time. And you walk away just like feeling awkward. I hated growing phases as a teenager because the only reason I would know I would grow is I would get into the car and hit my head or I'd bump up against something because I'm not used to being that tall. It always hurt. I hated growing randomly in spurts. That's a fun fact about me. Fun. Growing pains in a whole different way. What's your rating? A two. I don't have a fun analogy. A centaur on a two, two out of ten? No, because that would be fun if it was by <laughs> their own accord. No, it's just a two. How would that even work? It'd probably be around their bottom half. So think a dog in a tutu, right? Then think a horse in a tutu and then add a human torso to the horse in a tutu. How would you put it on them? Over the back legs, I would think. I think that'd be the easiest way to do it. I feel like it would have to be a ribbon. Are you could do that too. I don't think you could do a normal tutu where it's like humans where you can just put it on. I think you could slip it over the back legs and then up over the butt. Yeah, but the butt's so much bigger than the middle. I mean, it would have to be built for a centaur. You'd need to be much bigger than your average tutu. Or would it be around their waist? The human waist. Would that make sense? <laughs> you could have two tutus. It's like the discussion about if four-legged pets would wear pants what would that look like? Would they have all four legs in the pants or would it just be their hind legs in the pants? It's one of those things. Or just the front legs in the pants. It's one of those fun mental exercises. I think it would look more majestic if it was around their human waist versus just like randomly around their middle of the horse <laughs> bit. I mean, it's a centaur and a tutu. I don't know what you want. Answers. <laughs> I want answers. Never. But would you read this again? No. No. I wouldn't even give this to my kid. I've said that many, many, many times. Ella Enchanted's better, I swear, guys. I'm not crazy. I mean, you are, but... I mean... That's okay. It's in a good way. There are so many mid-lit books we've read from my middle school days where I'm like, did I just like trash? What is happening? <laughs> Every single one. I am determined there will be some books. It's a good book series. But have you read this book? What did you think? Do you think it's worth its kind of meh rating? Did you read any other Gail Carson Levine's books? Do you think a centaur wearing a tutu would have it around its horse middle or its human middle? See, what if it was around the human middle, but it was long and majestic and draped down the horse back? That's what I'm saying. That'd be so pretty. Do you have any other book recommendations for us? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you like this video, hit like. And if you're enjoying yourself, hit subscribe for more fun book content. Thank you so much for going through Ferris with us. You can keep up to date with us by checking us out on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. And you can help support our podcast by checking us out on Patreon, where for just $1 a month, you can get access to our bonus episodes where we look at the movie adaptations to some of your favorite books. This month we are exploring the simplicity of the post-apocalyptic book for children, City of Ember, and comparing it to its much more convoluted movie adaptation. Join us next time when we'll be going through A Song of Wraiths and Ruin, written by Roseanne A. Brown. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm Lizzie Sawyer. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time.